anyway, um, thank you all. And the Q and A is going to start now. Um, try and keep your questions direct, <coughs> simple, straight to the point. Peter doesn't want to hear how brilliant he is or how much of an asshole he is. He knows that already. Um, and uh, okay, <laughs> here's the guy who's uh, basically. Not the ornaments and the fixtures, 
but the fact that it works so incredibly well, to me, that's, that, that's my romanticism. I'm, I'm attracted to that as, as beauty on every level. So it's, there's differences of opinion. So that's kind of what I would say. I would challenge someone's opinion and say, well, I think differently than that. Do you, would you prefer to live in a really efficient, inefficient hut that has no heat, you know, that can't, that can't support you, that is not self-enclosed, that requires all this external stuff and maintenance, or would you like to have a home that can last your entire lifetime with virtually no maintenance, that is self-sufficient, self-supporting? I think if you draw the utilitarian arguments, uh, you bring them up to people, they'll, they'll quickly concede, I think. I mean, what, what matters in the end? Does it really matter what, what things look like in the long run? I, mean, I think we tend to be aesthetically driven just because we grow up into it and we identify with it. You know, I, I have plenty of artistic things and visual things that I identify with. I, I think they're beautiful walking around London. There's all these amazing old architecture. But I see it and I appreciate it for the romanticism of it, but I also know that things change. And it's more important, I think our survival is more important than uh, efficient survival in the long run is more important than just, you know, the aesthetic romanticism. So I think most would agree in the long run. But, I, but that's an argument that you can use if you encounter someone that says, oh, why don't I live in that's ugly? What kind of rationality is that, you know? Okay. Done? Thank you. Yeah. Um, somebody in the middle? Anybody in the middle? <coughs> guy in the green here, Jay? There's a guy in the green in front of me. Uh, hi there, um, sounds great. <laughs> um, I'm an engineer and I'm a researcher at Oxford University in environmental studies. Um, and I also want to work on this theme of efficiency and um, ask a question about efficiency. Um, it seems to me that the, the efficiency that is required to sort of um, bring about global sustainability um, and sort of equality for, for everybody, that's a function of sort of three things really. The, the, the resources we have available, um, the population of the planet, and um, the sort of the, the quality of life that we want. And until we, we determine what those three things are, do you think there's a danger in saying things like efficiency at all costs, given that that could lead to a, a loss of certain um, cultural uh, attributes like architecture um, that, that the people appreciate and they are not? Well, um, efficiency at all costs, I think, is simply a general rule. That, you know, we could get to a point where the efficiency, the, you know, that extra 1% of efficiency is not necessary. You don't have to go through that just to get that little extra bit because maybe things are so sustainable that there's such an ease already that this population is satisfied that it's not necessary. Um, if you go back to the third point that you mentioned in that list that you have regarding where the needs are, really, in effect, our needs should be related to what is possible with the internal structure, the inferential logic coming up with what I call natural law, based on what the earth can support, based on what we're defined by the environment that we're born into, and we have to align with it. So the maximization of the utility, if you will, of this, this approach really defines our needs. And, and we really have no choice but to kind of fall in line with natural law, you know what I mean? I, I really, I, people have a, a tendency to be very personal in their mind, personal in their views, thinking that, that they have some freedom of thought that somehow exceeds their, their reality. I'm sorry, that doesn't really work that way. Uh, we, we have to align with things, and our values should be derived. So it, it goes the other way around, is my point. Yeah, as an environmentalist, I'm very sympathetic to that argument. Um, but my, my point is that um, I think we, we, we could get to a, to a stage where we can produce um, where we don't have to be super, super, super efficient, where everything doesn't have to be around Right, yeah. Um, well, yeah, I understand. And it, so how do you determine that? Well, that, that's why I just commented on that extra 1%, or that extra 5%, or that extra 10%. I, I mean, we don't, it's not like it could be a stickler and go, well, we have to do all this and this and this. If things are working properly, and they're sustainable, and there's limited ne negative retroactions, and it, everyone's happy, we don't have some kind of, you know, deep, we don't have poverty here, we don't have pollution here, or deforestation here, or peak oil here, or any kind of peak resource. If everything is in balance and it's being maintained, then it becomes kind of a mood issue. If it's working and everyone's satisfied, there's no reason to have to go to some crazy, you know, extreme kind of efficiency. Sure. Okay, I can go to the right now. This person here, anyone? I, I, 
Um, yeah, I just want to say um, I've been successfully brainwashed by the movie. Thank you very much indeed. Um, <laughs> well done. Um, I wanted to say I thought, I think the film is amazing at uh, dissecting the evils inherent in our money system, which are palpable and they're very important to see. I also think it's a great um, advert for your resource based economy. It, it looks a bit like utopia porn. In some Excuse me, can you, can you ask the question? Yeah, sure. Um, what I'm basically saying is, I, I think the film's weak in terms of describing the transition from the place we're in now to the place that you're advertising. And that, that's the real problem that I have there. I can't wait to be in that world, but how do we get there? Well, that's the, uh, that's the, that's the million dollar question. <laughs> that's why we're here, that's why there's an event tomorrow, that's why the site next movement exists. You know, I, there's only so much I as an individual and my, my condition and my temperament and my, my intellectual capacity can say I couldn't sit here and tell you how to, quote, change the world. That's going to come from another place. That's going to come from, well, first of all, it's going to, it's going to be uh, navigated dynamically by what I consider to be the collapse of civilization because of what's outlined in the film. You're going to have problems and pressures that are going to emerge. You're going to have people seeking solutions to override and hopeful. The hopeful thing that will happen is that this type of direction is logically pulled through, as opposed to people falling back in some wildly outdated view. A uh, critical mass, though, is really what I'm going for. As I as I mentioned, addendum and started there, where I, I made that point about the need for critical mass. And it's if uh, you know this film doesn't carry over into the activist angle, but in the Zeitgeist movement, I talked to extensive lengths about the need to get people together across the world. And once you have enough people, you begin to put pressure on the establishment. You begin to have you know, more, um, well, you begin to have economic conferences with scientists that are behind it that can show the complete redesign of North America. That show, boom, here it is. And you get other country leaders or whomever to start to think about it. And you, in my mind, you develop a parallel structure, a parallel group of people that want to do something completely different and hopefully get the logic to pull through. And the timing will be such that it's a tipping point, and the powers that be are willing to accept or maybe will be forced to accept based on you know, the uprising and civil unrest and everything else that's happening, which I think will continue. Uh, that's how I see it, loosely speaking, a transition occur. But there's so many things that you really can't predict. So, But at the very base level, you have to get the world what you want. You have to get people across the world, across all borders, because this is a global concept uh, to want this. Can I just say as well, it's, it struck me that it wouldn't be pot is this is the sort of thing that everybody has to sign up to in order for it to work, surely? If you're talking globally, well, what, what are you going to do with people that insist on being irrational? Well, well, I, I think the term, well, okay, the Amish exist today. The Amish have isolated communities. The Amish have chosen to live lifestyles. And there are many other, you know, religiously oriented subcultures that, that live very, very differently than the modern capitalist, you know, liberal society that we have now. So you can accommodate those things. If someone doesn't see the efficiency, if they're really against it, there's no reason that, you know, that there's some animosity there. But they have to understand that if, I don't know, 60% of the world population wants to live in a resource-based economy and 40% don't, well, you can only hope that a compromise can be made. But I think actually those statistics that I just mentioned are kind of inaccurate. It'd be more like 90% of the population wants to live because you really do need global resource access back to and then the other 10% can be supplied with what they need. But the, what would you do if you were the other 10%? And you're watching everyone live in a very nice community. So I believe that they would come over to the other side to see the fruits of this. In fact, I, I have more respect for the Amish and these simplistic, more simplistic subcultures than I do for this modern capitalist world that's held them down to destroy itself. So, see my point. You know, it's, it, it really comes down to where the stability is. And I think that in our... Uh, and the education of anyone, they'll begin to reconcile that it's in their best interest to join a system that's actually sustainable and hopefully progressive and be willing to accept these changes. Okay, sure. okay. Uh, back to the left hand side then. Yes. Uh, okay. Hi, um, uh, about four and a half weeks ago, my son, my oldest son, sent me a, 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 an email aiming to see this film, we've just seen it again. Um, since then, uh, I've spent most of my time. Steve, please. What's your question? Yeah. All right. Please. Time for other people. Very, very recently, the world has been 
that's some big things with revolution Z or the beginnings of revolution Z in uh, North America in the Middle East. And we've seen uh, what happened yesterday in Japan and the nuclear explosion this morning. Um, and, and it's struggling after watching Al Jazeera and now Democracy Now, how we have to develop that way. Be, on the internet, there's been discussion uh, amongst us a lot about getting the city government. You know, we need communication first, proper, uh, to get some proper websites with. Um, I, I think uh, we have hundreds of chapters. Every chapter should be asked, get a, a team going, camera, film, do things, develop yourselves, develop your abilities, yeah, they're doing it. Yeah, that's what I'd like to do. Um, work with myself with the London chapter to do that. Um, and, and developing skills, I think, is very important. It's, it's the third benchmark along with resource person based economy, technology, and human skills and develop those abilities. I agree. I agree. Thank you. But that's what essentially that we're trying to do. I mean, the, yeah, as far as the city, though, as you mentioned, building the city, Put in a test city, doing something that we can show the world what it's, what it's capable of, is the intent. Building an isolated community, though, and showing yourself off and saying, okay, we have our, we have our sustainable, that's not going to fly in the current climate. So I just want to reiterate that if anyone thinks that that's a solution. There's nowhere to hide anymore. Uh, it's either the world learns that its survival is contingent upon it learning to work together, or it continues its, its slow, grueling breakdown. Yeah, um, but oh, just very briefly, because my daughter this morning when I told her I was coming here, oh, that's run by this guru, this deity, the leader who says there should be no leadership. I'm sorry, that's why human development is, for me, the third linchpin of the Zeitgeist movement. Okay, thank you. Uh, we've got this guy at the front here who's been waiting a while. I'll come back to you Hi, Peter. Darren. Hi. Um, Pretty much agree with everything you just said there in terms of how the world's going to go. Um, I've spoken to many, many people who read, who are intelligent, and, and a lot of them didn't know who you or even Jack were. Sure. And it's been around for ages. Sure. So my question to you would be obviously, it would take a catastrophe to get to the point of change. What could you guys do more mainstream, i.e., Discovery Channel, to, to get this documentary? out there, not amongst small groups like this, but mainstream. I've spoken to so many people and they do not know what the Zeitgeist movement is. Well, we're, I consider, I mean, if you really think about it, it's definitely an infancy stage. If you compare our numbers and our reach uh, with, with, by the way, no heavy monetary contributions, it's all volunteer and independent if we do this on our record, which is very powerful, by the way. But if you compare ourselves to other uh, activist organizations or what you want to call them, it took them much longer the audience and the group that we have. So I think it's the angle of progress for what is really only about two years ultimately. I think it's quite quite effective and quite profound. I'm trying to get the documentary on the documentary film channel. I've had you know communication with various various organizations to do whatever I can. And of course anyone can show the film. I, I give the film essentially out. Any television station can basically show it as long as they don't exploit it. And I don't I don't require any kind of money for it, which is quite and it's it for them because there is an audience and obviously it's dollar signs and everything else. But I guess there'll be a few company areas that have investments in certain places that we really want this document on, I would guess. I'm sorry, say that again? I guess there'd be a, a, a lot of directors, company owners that are capitalists. Well, that's all they want. This is what they see. They see dollar signs. So if they see an audience, you know, that's just a sad reality of it, why they rationalize it. Unless you occasionally get somebody that's in the mainstream that really believes in it, they can slide it in, which does occasionally happen in certain contexts. But, um, but I think the progress is there, I'm doing the best I can. It's, the movie was made in more of a quote, high budget kind of way with, with a much bigger spread to try to appeal to a, a diverse group as possible. So I'm, I'm doing the best that I can. It's really just up to everybody to continue. So what, what could we do as individuals? I mean, I work as a recruitment consultant, which effectively is, is against all the things I'm watching. Yeah. But, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I've started to go to work feeling like, I don't really want to do this because it's all about making a profit. Well, what does the average person just try to get by? Well, this is the complex reality. We have, you have to walk mm -hmm. into a line if you believe in this type of direction. Because you can't just throw everything down and assume it's going to happen tomorrow. You can't just uh, disregard money and, and your future. It's, it is, uh, 
it's paradoxical in a state of mind. So what I kind of tell people is, you kind of have to wear the movement on your the shoulder. You have to make it a part of your general life. You have to know that you have to submit to the system. If you have the option, if you're in college, try to do something that has some type of social benefit. Don't do what I was forced to do and be in advertising for a while. No, try to stay away from all of the, the parasitic industries and things that really do nothing at all. And there's a number of them. Uh, try to do something in you know, in the advanced academy, tele, excuse me, in the programming, things that relate to uh, design computers. Computers obviously aren't going to stop in their progression. In effect, and, and what we talk about here is very much based on computational ability to manage the Earth resources correctly. So these are very important, very important fields. So I would definitely recommend that as a general distinction. But to finish that point, just, anyway, if you're frustrated, don't tr try to balance your life, as I try to do my best, between your basic survival and trying to promote something that you feel is important for your future and your family's future, and the kids, obviously, their future, and realize that it's a, just a very noble thing to promote in and of itself. I could come work for you as a salesman or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I could come work for you as a salesman. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if I had any money to pay Right at the back, okay? We go up to the back of the <coughs> Hi Peter, this Hi. question relates to uh, media conditioning. I just want to know how mindful you are of the conditioning effects that your movies have on people who see them and how responsible you feel in relation to the honesty about how things are likely to change going forward in terms of social collapse and that kind of thing, and whether it's possible to project a better way to transition, a better way that we can go forward uh, that could be more acceptable and more humane overall. Well, I'm not advocating a uh, breakdown. I'm not, I'm not. I don't want to see people suffer. I'm. I'm. I'm, uh, I'm beside everyone. I'm watching what's happening and reporting what I observe and the research that I've done. So when I explain the collapse in the film as despairing as it may be, it's simply an observation. And you know, the film itself, I don't talk about you know the actual transition. You know, the ending is a big gesture. It's really this catharsis against this kind of monetary reality and all the things that go with it. But as far as positivity and transition, <coughs> The sad thing is biosocial pressure is what really influences people in their change. It takes stressors to get people to be motivated one way or another. They can be intellectual and they can rationalize and make decisions, but generally speaking, people tend to tend to maneuver themselves based on what the environment is dictating. So I think it's a natural consequence. First of all, if the system worked, let's put this out there, but if this if the free market, the free for all market as I call it, if it actually worked then why would I be here? I mean, if everything was in balance, then there'd be no reason to do anything. This, the resource-based economy is an answer to the failure of an evolutionarily flawed system. So I see the, dis the, the despairing um, attributes of the conflict, the instability, as a natural evolution out of this system, unfortunately, which will serve as a motivator intrinsically, inherently, for the population to realize that they have to do something new, and that it's time to start looking for new solutions, and essentially for a new social system that, where these things simply don't happen. Yeah, yeah I, I agree with the observations. I just wonder if it is, if it is possible for us to design a better way for the transition. Well, I, I'd, love to, I'd love to see, sure, I'd love to see other people uh, take a shot at it. I'm doing the best that I can in the way that I think is balanced and just you know, honest. You know, and, and of course, it's a movie, speaking of the media, quote, conditioning, so I do have to generate aesthetic for it through music and everything else to give a sense of emotional impression. But um, if you break this down the data and read the script, you know, that's, it is what it is. Like, I encourage anyone out there, all of us, anyone can be a filmmaker now, anyone can do anything in media, to investigate other means, and I'd certainly love to see it. So if you come up with it, please send it to me. Yeah, we're all working on it for sure. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Uh, Dr. Ryan again. Shove it on in the middle, please. No, in the red spot of it, please. Um, in your resource based economy, there will still be jobs of some sort, whether it's in 
scientists, technicians, engineers, computer designers, whatever. Right. Now, I've got a job, but my next door neighbour hasn't. Isn't that crazy and inequality? I don't know, why should I do the job anyway? Say the last part again? And why should I do my job anyway? My next door neighbour, he's, he's, he's doing pottery all day, you know, he's, he's got it. Does he have a financial support? Well, you're saying everybody's got abundance. Well, no. What, if I understand you correctly, the, the labor that's required in a resource based economy is substantially minimal than what you see today. And the big difference between what you're doing in a resource based economy versus what you're doing today, on, on, in most, most cases at least, is that it has a direct social tie. It supports you just as it supports everyone else. So it's a tr different train of thought. You, if you develop a value system, all of us have things that we like to do, things that we enjoy doing. And I think many of those things have to do with some type of labor, if you consider it as such. Investigate things. I love research. I read lots of books. I like to, to invent things whenever I have time to do so. I am certainly happy. I would personally be perfectly happy to run part of the city system just for my own satisfaction to know that it's going to keep the system working. It's going to be efficient and the appreciation of everyone else. You could exchange the labor where your commitment in a, a resource-based economy, say in the city structure, would be nominal, so nominal to the effect of just a few hours a week in this rotation that everyone in the society works with. It's about people learning that you don't have to have monetary reward to sustain yourself. I mean, we're not that lazy, really. you know? It's like, I really believe the conditioning of the modern culture is such that people have a knee-jerk reaction now to not want to do any type of labor. They want to get monetary reward for everything on one side simply because the labor is usually irrelevant. I mean, there's a great majority of occupations out there serve only a monetary employment function. They don't contribute to anything. People, the, the real satisfaction of people, with, uh, excuse me, of uh, the real satisfaction, excuse me, the most satisfaction oriented jobs, if that makes sense, tend to be ones that help people. I, I know lawyers that have been working for tobacco companies their whole life in criminal enterprises, and they retired and they went straight into pro bono work just to cleanse their soul. You know, there is a natural, I think, I, I believe in this society because the pressure for income is, not, is removed. Because the needs, the necessities of life, the needs of society is managed and maintained as the design of society and access abundance, people will volunteer left and right to want to contribute and to help and improve because the improvement that they make to the society is an improvement that comes back to good. Self-interest becomes social interest in this type of arrangement. And I think, I really, even if, even if you had 40% of the society utterly lazy, you still wouldn't need a fraction of the other percentage to, to pick up the slack. But I guarantee you that they'd be happy to do so. So you don't think people with jobs and people without jobs would in, in itself create some sort of inequality? I don't, I, don't, I don't believe, first of all, that no one would, quote, just not do anything. And I think that people would want to help. I think you, people have their artistic, personal interests, but I do deeply believe that it, in America, one of the most capitalist and self-indulgent and narrow societies on the planet that's been utterly groomed into this horrible state of mind um, of just blind, naked self-interest, they have, we have in America, uh, volunteerism that I believe it's in the companion guide. You remember what it is, Tom? Remember the, the statistics of volunteers in America? But it was colossal. I couldn't believe it when I read it. 45 It was amazing to see how many people, most people, by the way, that volunteer are actually in the lower income brackets, which I found fascinating too. Those that are most rewarded in the system are much, much less likely to contribute. It's those that actually see the basis of humanity that, that live in the common world, they're the ones that want to help. So that's another tidbit for you to consider. So, People will do so. They've proven it. Uh, we have a huge, huge uh, volunteer, uh, uh, nonprofit volunteer sector, if you will. And in fact, there's a book I recommend uh, that talks about that explicitly called The End of Work by Jeremy Rifkin. I recommend that to you because it's a really brilliant point that he makes. He's not actually an application of what we talk about. I try to get in touch with him, it doesn't matter. But he, he at least points this out specifically that in the future, because of the automation of labor, because of the lack of ability for people, majority of people to be employed, other sectors will come into fruition and they'll be very, very different. Now, I don't necessarily agree with that particular angle, but his, his understanding of the nonprofit sector as a base support where 
in a society where everyone is trained to be as capitalistic and ruthless as possible is an amazing, to me, testament of some deep down human attribute that really does want to help each other and are willing to do so. So I checked that book out if you want more information on that point. Um, I've got this, this one on the end of the front of the I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Hi, Peter. Uh, Paul, I came all the way from Chicago to talk to you. Long, long life. <laughs> so thank you for giving me my kind of go on for just a moment, just bring me a little time for that. But in time here, I've been working kind of behind the scenes on how to do that transition that this gentleman, the, the moment children in the back, spoke about. And I think that it would be a fantastic way, but I wanted to kind of preface that by asking you some questions. Uh, so people want to do more, and many simply don't have the time, resources, or influence to get out there and say, hi, this is what we would like to do, how about you jump on board? Because they have jobs, because they have debt, because they're going to continue to have bills and things that are going to keep them mentally drained outside of what media is doing already. So how would you suggest the tired people do, or what would you suggest for these tired people to do, or how to, how to get them into a transitory state outside of simply spamming links sure. to, to their friends and try to get them to check out this information? Well, I, again, that, that's, a, that's a, I think, a per case basis type of question. You know, for the average wage slave that's racked into debt, can't think about anything, forget any type of social activism, they're not concerned about you know, the, the Middle East wars, you know, they, they, everything's locked in. This is actually, in my mind, I think, intrinsically built in the system as an aside. The distraction of this, this oppressive um, deprivation that, that permeates, especially now, is serves the establishment in a strange way because it keeps people so narrowly encompassed. And that's, that's essentially the point. So they, can't, they don't have the means or the energy to think about these things because they can barely take care of themselves. It's a sad, it's a sad state of social control, I think. It's somewhat somewhat realistic in the minds of those that, that are around and want to maintain their power establishment, but I want to pull out, it's not a conspiratorial notion, it's a natural kind of, natural element gravitation of the system to be maintain their positions. But to answer your question, I think you have to take it on a per case basis and speak with the position, each individual, get their background and get them to relate the fact that what they're doing most likely, uh, well, first of all, their entire position, of course, is in, because of the system, so there's there's point one, and then you go on up to their actual level of, of uh, personal, their actual personal relationship level of what their occupation is. Do they have a family? Uh, you see what I mean? You can't just blank. I can't blanketly tell you. Or in fact, goes for almost any kind of communication. It's a universal to approach anyone. But you know, if they're stuck in a position of debt, you're going to have a hard time one way or another. If they're narrowly defined, they're very support themselves. But just remind them that. The oppressive system is what's keeping them down, and if they want out of it, they have to make some type of stride. You know? I mean, that's definitely a good point. It kind of possibly leads into the next question I had about uh, in the film, a dollar amount was referred to in terms of what it costs to go to war and how much, if that money were to be put towards building infrastructure, how it could have been done on a global basis. Is there a particular dollar amount that it would cost or would take to initiate either a survey or building this test city? Yeah, that's a good question. I asked John about the test city, and um, I can't remember the uh, carrying capacity of that city, but he, at that stage he said it was rather small, and he, he quoted about a billion dollars, which I think might have been rather low, but it's really hard to financially foreshadow anything. The survey is something that really has almost been done in a lot of ways already by private corporations, it's simply getting that data. But we can't even get straight data out of the oil company. I mean, it's really hard when you have proprietary institutions that want to protect their self-interest. And since scarcity is one of the biggest drivers of demand, this is profitable demand, you, you enter into a world that you really can't have honest information. So it's really just stopping it and making the information that they have at one level. And then it's using advanced technologies to, to scour the earth and survey, which there are many, many forms of radiation technology that can be used to see. Uh, lots of attributes. There's a lot of technical things you can do, which would be extremely expensive. In my